So invariably when I travel, I forget something. And this time I forgot my speaking notes. So what I did is I had my wife uh, photograph the uh, cue cards. I traveled with a 1970s era iPad, otherwise known as postcards, the four by sixes. And I write little shorthand gibberish on them. It makes no sense to anyone but myself. And that's what I forgot at home. So I, she took pictures of it and I have it on my, uh, on my device here. So I'll be doing virtual, virtual cue cards. Um, Anyways, I'm um, going to be talking about something that I've never talked about before, which is arrears. I thought it would be interesting to, to do the research, so then I accepted the, uh, the invitation. So that's what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to be organizing along the following lines. First, I'm going to look at the evidence about those factors commonly thought to give rise to an increase uh, in arrears. I'm going to pivot to uh, looking ahead at what's you know, what's ahead for mortgage debt servicing ratios? That's just, okay, the percentage of a household budget that goes to pay that mortgage. That's the thing that uh, the Bank of Canada has been very, uh, and indeed the Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions and Finance Canada have been uh, really uh, gripped with. It's like, what happens when interest rates rise? Are people going to be able to pay their mortgage? So I'm going to get into a little bit of the metrics that the Bank of Canada has uh, put out there in the last little while on that. Um, and then I'm going to uh, bat clean up with talking about arrears trends in the Greater Golden Horseshoe uh, region where you, uh, you're stomping ground. And uh, in the context of expectations for interest rates and employment and uh, price growth and what that means for arrears uh, next year and the year after. Um, it's a little tangent. When I gave a presentation years ago to our, uh, our board of directors, uh, afterward one of the directors came up to me and said, Greg, Nobody likes charts, nobody understands charts. <laughs> and the good news is, well, I'm an economist and I came with charts, but uh, I'm, I'm gonna make fun of some of them. And, uh, and generally, I don't put charts up anymore because the whole point of a chart is to reinforce your point. And if everyone's looking at the chart, trying to make sense of the chart, they're not listening to you. So if I hit the, the, the blank screen button, if I remember to do that, uh, that's why it's, it's, it's to deny who the, the fun of trying to make sense of my charts. So you'll be forced to list to my mellifluous words. Anyways, um, I'm a real fan of the bottom line up front first, and uh, that's as follows. What's next for arrears? Nobody knows. Uh, it's unlikely to go down anymore, but is it going to go sideways? Is it going to rise? And if it's going to rise or go sideways, for how long is that going to go on? And if it's going to rise, by how much and over what duration? Nobody really knows. That's, that's why um, those who are paid to worry about mortgage defaults uh, have been tightening regulations uh, over a number of years now, as you know. So that's the bottom line up front. What's next? That's always the most interesting question in life, and uh, nobody really knows. So you're wondering, why am I, why am I here? <laughs> I'm supposed to have all the answers. Well, I don't. But I'm going to walk through why nobody knows. Um, so without further ado, let's get into it. So I'm going to be talking about those, uh, the factors, first of all, about, you know, the factors uh, widely thought to cause arrears to increase. That's either over tightening of a policy or uh, a decline in prices where people are underwater in their mortgage, uh, interest rate increases so they can't pay their mortgage when it resets, and lastly, uh, employment changes. So talking about the correlation in these things and what we're seeing in arrears. So let's start with policy first. So here we go. Now the data for Vancouver and Toronto that's publicly available only goes back to the third quarter of 2013. So I can't go back any farther than that. So the policy changes that, uh, that have been put on the table actually predate this chart. Um, a bunch of stress tests, the most recent one being B20 that, was, uh, that took effect, it was announced in October of last year and took effect uh, on New Year's Day of this year. Um, that was not by any stretch of the imagination the first stress test that was introduced. There was one in uh, 2010 that was introduced for uh, for high ratio mortgage, whenever I say high ratio mortgages, I just mean those people who have to take out mortgage default insurance. They have less than a 20% down payment. And uh, so those are high ratio mortgages. Low ratio mortgages are the ones who have more than a 20% down payment. So in 2010, they put a stress test in for uh, high ratio borrowers. And then again in 2012, and then in, in uh, the, the fourth quarter of 2016, which I'll get to in a minute, um, 
in the first quarter of 2016, that's when they put in place a, uh, CMHC announced the policy where you had to have a 10% down payment on every $100,000 uh, for, uh, for your mortgage uh, over 500000 up to a limit of a million, at which point you no longer uh, qualify for more default insurance. Um, in the third quarter, that's when Vancouver put in the foreign buyers tax, a metro van. What you'll notice on this chart, whether you're looking at Vancouver, Toronto, the arrears rate has declined. So this suggests, of course, this tightening of policy all along the way hasn't done anything to cause uh, an increase in the arrears rate. So there's been over tightening of uh, policy uh, by this metric. Um, again, the stress test in the fourth quarter of 2016, that was put in place for uh, high ratio borrowers. Uh, so they had to do a stress test for those people less than a 20% down payment. And then the so-called Ontario Fair Housing Plan in, uh, April, on April 20th, 420 of 2017, um, so-called. And then the stress test that was uh, announced in the fourth quarter, it was in October of 2017 that took effect, uh, January of this year. And last, and I've helpfully color-coded them to correspond to the political party, you'll notice they're all liberal. And then the last one, the NDP government, the Orange, um, which is, they announced a host of measures uh, aimed at cooling their housing market that included an increase in the foreign buyer's tax and a, spec a so-called speculation tax, what I'll just call a vacancy tax. So all along the way, you know, arrears rates haven't gone up, so it hasn't been over-tightening policy, at least from the standpoint of uh, the arrears rate. So I'm going to walk through, um, you know, they, they were worried about uh, our, the loan to income ratio, the, the, the zone where uh, the governor of the Bank of Canada gets worried is when you take out a loan that's uh, four and a half times or more of your income. And that was what drove a lot of uh, the uh, tightening in, in, uh, in policy when from the standpoint of the, you know, the mortgage stress test, introducing them again and again. So this is just the GTA. And this is the, uh, the, the, the year, that's the vintage of originations that year. So the way to interpret this chart is anything, that the, the darker red it gets, the, the more worries, the, the darkest of dark red, that's your 450 and, and more, 450% uh, um, from the standpoint, you know, your loan to income. So let's just walk through the vintages here. 2013 and, well, 2014, you got, you got some. The, uh, the, the lighter, the less dark, darkest, uh, darker of red is the 400 to 450. He, he likes to worry about that too, so it's four times and more. So here we are in 2015, as you can see, it's, you know, the, the loan to income. It's getting more worrisome from the standpoint of originations. And here we are in 2016, and there's an awful lot of dark red. So, yeah, this is what captivated their imaginations about tight, tightening um, policy when it comes to the standpoint of uh, mortgage stress tests. And here we are in 2017, um, a, a little less. But the thing of it is, that's just the growth. Now you have to look at, you know, also the stock. The other thing, too, is when you take a look at 2017, let's just rewind it all the way back to 2013. Whoops. There we go. Compare that with that. It's not like the 400 plus have disappeared. So the thing of it is, is that there's, there's still a lot of high ratio uh, borrowing going out there from the standpoint of uh, the loan to income. And that's just the growth in it. But it's, it's cooled it down compared to 2016. But uh, that's just the flow. You, they, the bank is worried about the stock of those loans, right, going south. So that's what we're looking at here is the share of new mortgages with a loan to income ratio of 450%. And you're looking at insured and uninsured mortgages. And you'll notice that in the fourth quarter of 2016, the rules were tightened for uh, mortgage default insured mortgages and the share went down, but not so for the uninsured mortgages. And only after the introduction of B20, uh, the most recent uh, tightening of the mortgage stress test, for uninsured borrowers, has, has that gone down too? So, from the bank standpoint, they're they're very happy with uh, the way that that's played out. So, the whole reason behind this is as interest rates rise, they want to make sure that people can pay their mortgages. So, let's uh, let's pivot now and talk about the other factors: home prices versus arrears. And I'm going to go walk through how to interpret this thing. So. We always talk about correlation. 
it's not cause effect, but there's a correlation. The association of uh, changes in home prices with arrears. So I'm looking here at a, a correlation from, you know, a big correlation to no correlation. No correlation is the zero. And indeed, from the uh, uh, minus 0.5 to uh, plus 0.5, that's sort of the zone of weak sauce. It's a very weak correlation. Um, once you get past the uh, minus 0.5 and to 1 or minus 1, perfect negatively correlated or perfectly positively correlated, that's, you know, the closer you get to 1, the more strong it is. But you also have to test for whether there's a statistical significance in that relationship. And so I've done all, all, the, all the homework there. And wouldn't you know, for home prices, it's kind of, it's not even kind of, it's like, eh, kind of in the zone of weak sauce, the change in prices. So the thing of it is, is that, you know, if you're underwater in your mortgage, if you uh, owe more than the house is worth, people don't sell their home like it's a stock. They, they stay in it. And it's really uh, a decline in home prices, too, is associated with a host of other things th that's going on. <clears throat> But people don't just, oh, uh, I owe more on the house than it's worth now because the market's gone down. They don't just pack up and move. So I've always impressed on my guys uh, back at work. Just know what your data looks like and hmm, brace yourself. Here comes the first chart. It's not pretty, um, but it'll be brief. So here's what the data looks like on the change in home prices versus arrears. So it's pretty hard to make a, a, a good correlation. They're not moving in mirror image to one another or in tandem to one another. So it's, as I say, it's, it's in the zone of weak sauce. Um, all of, the way these things are going to be organized is it's, oh, and better yet, this is a dual axis chart, which I hate to foist on anyone, but here you go. Uh, on the right, it's your year over year change in Ontario home prices, and the arrears rate is on the left. Uh, so, you know, in the, uh, in the early 90s, that was when we had a housing recession. If you remember, uh, interest rates went through the roof, and that's where, uh, that's likely reflected in the arrears. Not so much the change in home prices. Anyway, let's move on to the next one. So let's talk about interest rates versus arrears. The idea is, you know, if interest rates rise, people aren't going to be able to pay their mortgage, and arrears rate goes up. So they'll be positively correlated, one would think. Higher interest rates, higher arrears. And sure enough, um, it's still in the, the weak sauce zone of kinda. And here's the chart. So the five-year benchmark mortgage interest rate on the right and the arrears rate on the left. And you can see that you know, there's a pretty decent correlation there. And it's statistically significant as well. But what's worrisome to me when I was looking at this is that, to me, the five-year benchmark rate isn't so important as the reset. So I was looking at a five-year differencing on the benchmark mortgage interest rate uh, as compared to arrears. And uh, there was not a good statistical relationship. And indeed, the sign was the wrong, was the wrong sign. It's like, as, as, the, uh, as interest rates reset lower, arrears went up. So to me, it's like, ah. Uh, I'll take that with a grain of salt in terms of uh, home prices and arrears, the correlation in them. Nonetheless, it's the kind of thing that keeps the bank uh, up at night and indeed uh, the finance minister. So uh, yeah, that's why they tighten mortgage regulations. So let's take a look at employment. Well, now we're into the zone of strong sauce. Go figure. If you lose your job, you're going to have trouble paying your mortgage, when it, particularly as it comes due. Uh, and even as it doesn't, you know, if it comes due, they're, especially now with B20, they're going to be testing on income, right? So anyways, um, yeah, this is the year-over-year -year change uh, in Ontario employment versus the year-over-year -year change in arrears rates. And yeah, there is a, a strong correlation, a statistical, uh, statistically significant one as well. Now, <laughs> the chart itself is, this is the ugliest one, I, I, I promise you. So the, the one on the right, that's the, the, the level change on a year-over-year -year basis. Sorry, percent change on a year-over-year -year basis. No, it doesn't. It says percent change, but it's actually level change. Never mind the label. Uh, and then you've got the black line, which is your Ontario arrears rate on a year-over-year -year change basis. But in a really fine line, just to make it easier to kind of follow about what's going on, because not everyone's used to thinking of, you know, if it's just slightly above, then the arrears rate is rising. If it's slightly below, then the, interest, the arrears rate is shrinking. So that's basically, you know, this whole thing here, that whole thing there, it corresponds to the arrears rate declining, which corresponds to employment rising. So, you know, there's a decent relationship there. But, yeah, it's, 
It's ugly. So let's talk about, no, oh, just turned it off, there we go. Let's pivot a little here and switch gears to some of the Bank of Canada's research. They did a little thought experiment a little while ago about, okay, what happens when interest rates uh, rise by the mortgage, the five-year mortgage rate rises by a percentage point compared to when they took the mortgage out. So in 2019, those folks who were going to review that uh, uh, a five-year mortgage that's, uh, that was originated in 2014. So if they're facing a 1% increase, and that's a reasonable assumption, right? Um, what percentage of those mortgages uh, in 2014 that were originated, what percentage of those are going to have an increase in the mortgage debt servicing ratio of less than 3%, between 3 and 5%, and more than 5%? Well, the vast majority in 2019, 94% uh, of them are going to have an increase of 3% or less. And none of them are going to be facing an increase in the mortgage debt servicing ratio of more than 5%. So, you know, the remainder is between 3 and 5%. But the vast majority of them, that's yeah, no problem, really. Because the idea is, of course, that over this time, incomes have risen as well, which the Bank of Canada estimates, you know, lo looking at history, they, they pegged at it. It's basically, it works out to 2.1% a year. It's sort of reasonable. But in 2020, things change a little bit because a greater percentage of those mortgages that were taken out in 2015, uh, they're looking at a mortgage debt servicing ratio uh, that increases by uh, more than 5% or more. A little less than half only are looking at an increase uh, in the mortgage debt servicing ratio of about, you know, uh, 46% of 3% of or less. And the, the remainder in between the two. So it's, you know, it was one of these thought experiments where, oh look, if you're highly indebted, higher interest rates are going to hurt you more. Well, duh. So this is, so that was the, that's again the flow. This is the stock of a mortgage is from origination in 2014 to 2019 and from 2015 to 2020 in the first and second panels. It's tough to see, but the reason I love this thing is it's such an optical illusion. And I, I recently met with uh, the Bank of Canada's, uh, the governor and his staff. And afterwards, uh, I applauded them on this wonderful optical illusion. The point of it is like, okay, they don't publish the numbers behind this other than the numbers that are there. And the, the point of it is that in uh, 2014, the one, those mortgages that are originated in 2014, and this is all bracketed by uh, loan to income ratios, like 18% of those mortgages in, uh, that were taken out in 2014 were uh, uh, loan to income ratios of 450 or more. And loan to income ratios of between 350 and 450, those 18 percent of them, and so on and so on. <clears throat> and the point of it is, is that you know, for those folks in 2019, regardless of your loan to income, when it resets, the, the, what happens here is, okay, what you're looking at is your mortgage debt servicing ratio, and then what happens when it resets at the higher, at the one percent interest rate increase in uh, 2019, and and likewise from 2015 to 2020. And again, it's it's one of these. Oh, look! If you're highly indebted, it's going to hurt you more. So that's the the top line there, the 450 plus loan to income guys. So this is just taking out the 2021, because there's not really much there's not really much to see in 2019. But Wil uh, Carolyn Wilkins, the uh, the deputy governor, just recently gave a. Uh, a talk, and this is the one that she pulled out. And what it looks like, you know, because when you see this this dotted line go up, it looks like it's so much higher in all these cases, but it's not. It's because you're coming from a lower level up, and so I applaud them on the uh, optical illusion. Because I, because I have no life, I took out a ruler and I sort of went across the uh, across the thing, and I worked out basically eyeballed the numbers. And what you see here is there's really not much to see here because it's, it's only in the, the vintage 2015 mortgages uh, that in 2020 when they reset, you're going from, no, you're, the, the mortgage debt servicing ratio goes from 31.5 to 34%, so it's, it's a pretty small increase. And uh, there's really not much to see as far as the rest of them go, so it, it makes it look like it's a lot worse problem than it is, so it's, again, it's a communications vehicle. So it's like, oh, this is why we're captivated with it, but it's like if they actually publish the numbers, it's like, eh. So uh, we're going to pivot now and look at trends in and around the, the GTI. I said that they was with the, uh, the previous chart was the ugliest one, but maybe I lied because this one is, uh, is not so hot. 
It's, a, it's what I call a, uh, a plate of spaghetti. The point of this plate of spaghetti is, is the, the trend of them is all downward. Again, you know, the, the data started in the third quarter of, of 2013, and the most recent data is the second quarter of 2018. And the point of it is, is that <clears throat> they're all trending lower. Doesn't matter where in the greater golden horseshoe you are. Um, the other thing that to notice out of this is that Toronto's the red line and Ontario overall is the black line. So they track pretty darn closely. So although I don't have historical data on Toronto, if this relationship holds going back in time, and there's no reason to think that it won't, uh, we can go back to 1990 and that's my very last slide. So <clears throat> that's the point is that it's been trending lower, but it looks like it's kind of started to either stabilize or bottom out in the second half of, uh, of last year. And indeed, in a couple of markets, it's risen just a little bit. Brantford, I'm looking at you. But generally, um, yeah, it's, it's stabilized around where it is now for the last little bit at the tail end. So here's the trends in Toronto, bracketing it into mortgage at origination. What's kind of unintuitive about this is that the smaller the mortgage, the, the more recently uh, it's, it's pinged higher on the arrears rate. And that's because of CMHC, this is CMHC stuff. Uh, they explained that you know, those people are taking out those small mortgages are generally uh, lower income, less job secure folks. So um, in all likelihood, their, their tenuous employment relationship uh, is, is, uh, is evidenced in the recent uptick in the, those mortgages at origination uh, recently that, that ticked higher. But you don't know the vintages of all these things as well. That's the thing, it's, it's a mishmash of all of them. So I'd, I'd like to get the data, but of course CMHC doesn't like to release data that doesn't fit their communications message. <laughs> uh, here, here's the breakdown in average monthly obligations in Toronto. And what you'll notice is the mortgage, of course, is, is basically half of their in, entire uh, monthly obligation. And indeed, it's, uh, it's increased by more than, than the others as well. Oh, oh look, we've got a table on that. So, you know, the, uh, between the second quarter of 2018 compared to a year prior, the increase has gone up by 100. This is your, your monthly obligation. Uh, the total has gone up by 200. So, you know, you're basically looking at about half of it. But they've all gone up. And as interest rates rise, of course, that monthly obligation is going to increase, particularly on those things that are flexi, like HELOCs. And if you're on a variable rate mortgage, well, yeah, that too, right? So that's, that's generally thought by economists. It's like, yeah, Canadians are really serious about paying their mortgages until they just can't. Uh, there's not a whole lot of strategic defaults um, where if you're underwater, you walk away. Remember when the, the depth of the recession in 2008, 2009, I did a radio show with uh, the then, then president of Korea, and uh, Ann Bosley, and uh, she took a call saying, you know, somebody wanted to, to buy a, a foreclosed property. So it's like, well, you're going to have to go to the States because in Toronto at that time, there, were, there was no foreclosed, foreclosures really going on. Um, anyways, the, uh, the mortgage obligation, and the, uh, the HELOCs, HELOCs is your big growth too, by the way, and uh, that's why they're, they're also, you know, OSFI recently published a little thing saying, yeah, you want to take into account uh, HELOCs when you're doing mortgages. It's not just equity, it's like inc increased scrutiny on income and indeed a hypothetical, what, you know, never mind how much you actually owe on your HELOC, but let's say you maxed it out, um, then what? So that's what they're doing, they're qualifying mortgages uh, TD was the first to cross the line, and you probably saw that in the, in the news. Anyways, others are going to be following suit count on that because OSFI says so. And my last slide in the bunch. So here's your arrears rate for Ontario. Remember when I said that you know, Ontario and, you know, and Toronto, they track pretty darn closely, and let's expect that they do uh, going all the way back in time here as well. This is from the Canadian Bankers Association. So this is basically all the chartered banks. So here's your arrears rate going back to January of 1990, uh, and it ends in June of this year. That's the latest available. And the long term, that's in your red line. The black line, that's where we are or, and where we were. And you'll see just how far below the long term arrears rate we are. So if anyone thinks it's going to go lower in an era of higher interest rates, uh, I'll smoke what you're smoking. But uh, 
the point of it is, is we are actually farther below the long-term average now than we were at the depth uh, just before we went into, uh, into recession. So <laughs> there's only one way to go, and that's up. But you can also slide sideways. I just don't think that sideways is as probable as it going up. Now, here's the thing. I can't tell you how many mortgages are out there in Toronto, let alone, uh, so I can for Ontario, but for Toronto I can't. And I'd have to make some Herculean assumptions uh, to do some mental, uh, mental math gymnastics to get you how many mortgages are outstanding in, in, um, in Toronto. So I can tell you the arrears rate, but I can't tell you how many mortgages are out there. So if you're talking about a hypothetical increase in, interest, in arrears rates, how many mortgages, um, that means that you'll be writing a business on foreclosures. I, I can't do that. I hope to do that next year, because I'm going to go to, I'm going to approach Equifax, who would have the data. Their, their data ain't cheap, but they'll have the data on that that allow me to actually calculate those sorts of things. So maybe I'll see you in a year's time. Uh, with, <laughs> with some news on that. But, uh, you know, what's next? As I said, it's always the most interesting question. Nobody knows, but I'm guessing that it's not going to go sideways for very long. It's going to go up as interest rates rise. But the key question is how much are interest, interest rates going to rise? Um, we're at the overnight lending rate now is at 175, and the neutral zone uh, is between 2.5 and 3.5. And so, you know, that's why economists on Bay Street and, uh, and others think that, and Polos has taken great pains to say, yeah, interest rates are going higher, but it's going to be paced by the data, and they're sensitive to the fact that they know that highly indebted Canadians are highly sensitive to just little uh, interest rate increases, and so they're going to, you know, let the data guide them as to how fast they raise interest rates. But make no mistake, interest rates are going up, particularly, you know, they have to raise them so they'll have something to cut should we, God forbid, get dragged into a recession, because there's very few made in Canada recessions that you can point to. Generally what happens is Canada is dragged into a recession by factors outside its border, such as the 2008-2009 one. It, uh, it, came through first, it came through both channels, the investment and the trade channel. Uh, and there was unprecedented, unprecedented job losses that bounced back pretty quickly because, you know, it's not how far you fall, it's how far you bounce. And uh, so that, you know, going back to the correlation on employment, the big concern always has been among policymakers that what if we're dragged into a recession and people lose their jobs? What does that mean for the financial system writ large because of so much debt that's, that's a wash, that we're awash in? And the Bank of Canada recognized that they're going to be a glacially slow increase to 2.5%. And nobody's talking about you know, a cyclical peak um, that ends in the neutral zone. But I can tell you from having met uh, Polos just the other day that he doesn't seem particularly, uh, his imagination is not captivated beyond getting it to neutral. Um, because interest rates, uh, sorry, uh, inflation is still pretty darn well behaved. They're like right in the center of their 1% to 3% target rate. That's how they uh, set interest rates, is trying to keep inflation between 1% and 3%. And the, you know, the, 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 the bullseye on that is 2%. And we're right at 2% now. And again, to, to keep that to keep overall inflation at that target zone, that's why he's going to be raising rates. But nobody's talking about himself as included about going on beyond neutral. So you know, between now and a year's time from now, sure, maybe three quarters of a, a percentage increase uh, in the five-year mortgage rate. The vast majority of Canadians, of which you know they take out that, and about a fifth of those every year renew. So. Um, we can see the arrears rate maybe going up, but it's, it's not going to be one of these things where it reverts to long-term mean overnight. Unless, of course, <laughs> unless, of course, it does because we're dragged into a recession and there's massive uh, job losses. And so with that, I'll just, uh, I'll leave it there. We might have some questions. Oh, sure. So if anybody has any questions, after that very uh, comprehensive and colorful look at mortgage arrears. Um, we have, Shannon should be around with a microphone, so I think we have one over here. Shannon. Thanks, Shannon. Um, those statistics from the CBA are, are um, from the major banks. Um, there's increasing exposure and a lot of mortgage, um, people taking mortgages out 
are no longer able to do so from the major financial institutions, and so they're heading off into private lending. Uh, do you have any comment about the impact of that part of the lending market on this whole what might be a house of cards environment that we're living in? I sure do. So every year, uh, Veritas, they're a buy side uh, research firm. So they don't, have, they don't sell stocks, they sell research. So they have no skin in the game. They're not a sell side research firm, they're just buy side. They do a housing summit every year. And um, the last few years, they've had private lenders as a panel on there. And yes, indeed. Um, Prospective home, home buyers who don't qualify for a mortgage at the major chartered banks, the, the private lenders are seeing a lot more of those folks. And they love it because they're high credit quality. Uh, and so the credit quality of their book has gone up. They used to be bank customers, now they're private uh, lender customers, and they love it. So of course it's at a higher rate, right? And nothing's for nothing. Um, so I can tell you, one of the bottom lines in the last, this very last one, and it was, it was a, within the last couple of months, one of the, the key questions is, as interest rates rise, are these people going to be able to pay their debts? So they're, 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 they're curious about that themselves. So certainly the increase in private lending as interest rates uh, rise, um, that's one of the things that and we're going to have to keep an eye on. Now, to the extent that they're taking out uh, longer term fixed mortgages versus variable mortgages, that's going to play into it, right? Because it doesn't matter uh, how much the five year rate rises if you're, you're sheltered under a nice fixed rate. It's when it, when it resets. But that's, that's the key question. Is interest rates rise with those private lenders particularly? Are they going to be able to pay their debts? I'm guessing not. they're not in the business to lose money, so I don't think they're going to lose a whole lot. But I'm thinking they're, if they're thinking that, that it's an open question, uh, they're thinking that, yeah, some of them, some of them are going to go uh, into foreclosure. Sorry, just following up uh, on this gentleman's question. Does, does anyone have a chart that shows the proportional growth in that market? And also, question of the term, because I, I'm familiar with one of them generally shorter term lenders sometimes. Is there statistics I can find easily? No. So that's one of the, the key, you know, I guess it was not the last budget, the budget before where um, in the federal budget they threw all sorts of money at Statistics Canada and CMHC to come up with more housing data. Because there's a lot more housing data in the US than there is in Canada. I, I get a daily email on, uh, on rears rates in the states, but the, the kind of, or um, and statistics on applications that are turned down and all sorts of metrics that exist in the states but not here in Canada. Um, it's been recognized at the Bank of Canada that that um, has increased, but not to the point where it's super worrisome. But that's another thing that I'd, I'd like to, uh, to get um, through my contacts is, is to put together a, a time series on that to see their market share um, because that's not readily available. So again, maybe in a year's time watch for that because I'm, I've got money in, a, uh, in the budget to, to approach data sources that would be helpful with that. And again, the, the contacts that I've made at these, uh, these summits with private lenders themselves. So uh, the bottom line is there's no readily available statistics on their market share nor on the, uh, on the financials behind that, the, the, the qualitative, never mind the quantitative. You had a question? No, it's the same, oh. the same issue. I just wonder if that trend you're showing um, may just be a reflection that the money's gone to private lending and the arrears rate may be quite different relative to the long term rate. It might be higher. Well, at this point, it's too early to tell because if you go back to, you know, the, as far as the interest rate resets goes, the, the, the pain hasn't really started yet, but that's not to say that it won't, particularly for those high, you know, loan to income folk. And again, if they lose their job, well, then what, right? Just on the, the question about the, the data on uh, private lenders, actually Bank of Canada put something out very recently. If people want to give me their card, I'd be happy to send it to a link to them, uh, and they can take a look at it. And it shows that in, you know, year over year for, in Toronto, that there's been a significant increase for their private lenders. The market itself has declined, but the private lenders 
their share has risen from, if I recall correctly, say 5% to 8%, and I expect it's only going to continue. One of your charts, um, you, you showed that uh, there was the Bank of Canada one that you said they didn't show you the numbers behind it. Um, when they do those calculations about what the debt service is going to be at origination and in five years' time, do you know what they assumed as far as an increase in interest rates, number one? And number two, did they take into account that the mortgage uh, balance uh, would have decreased over the, the five years that the mortgage was outstanding and calculate the debt service on the new reduced balance? Excellent question. Yeah, the the one with the reset for 2014 and the yes. 2015 resets, that was part of the hypothetical thought exercise of a percentage increase for those who are renewing in 2019 and a two percent increase in 2020. So that was the assumption underlying that. Uh, they're looking at an, an, an increase of, of two percent versus where we are now. Right. So, the mortgage would have gone from say. $500,000 down to, say, $450,000. Right. Did they calculate it on four fifty dollars instead of on five hundred? dollars Yes, they, they did. And indeed, they also uh, assumed that the, their incomes over that time, that's why the debt servicing ratio over that path was on a, on a lower glide path, is because their incomes were also increasing. So that's why the ratio is, is declining. And then on the reset, for those, particularly for those, those uh, high ratio, uh, for high loan to income borrowers, it resets and it wipes out all of that improvement and in fact makes it worse. So that's, so they're mindful of that. So they, they are calculating it on the, on the decline balance, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sure. You commented on the Bank of Canada's caution in terms of raising interest rates. Um, obviously this would be for rates within the bank's control, but I'm thinking what about rates outside of their controls? Let's say uh, you have a scenario where we have large fiscal deficits in the United States that have to be financed, drawing savings from all around the world, wouldn't that tend to push up long-term rates everywhere? Yes and no, my favorite answer. Um, so one of the things that I do, uh, I track on a weekly basis, <clears throat> the 10-year uh, Canadian versus U.S. bond and you know where, where we are in relation to the normal spread. Um, and then between the five and the ten year bond for Canada and then the spread between the five year bond and the five year mortgage. There's, there's a great correlation between all of these things. Um, as the uh, US rate rises, that's invariably going to drag up the Canadian uh, counterpart. Um, but when you follow all those linkages along, how does that translate into the five year? It's like th there's, there's room for uh, the five year bond uh, to, to move up and still not have the five year mortgage rate move up with it. So, but you know, it depends on, again, the magnitude and over what time. Um, your point is well taken. That these are things way outside the control of the Bank of Canada. But um, it's not, it's not a worry until it is because as you, as you, as you correctly pointed, what if you know, uh, investors become quite concerned about the U.S. deficit and then they, they push theirs through the roof? Um, we'll see what happens. What's next is always interesting. But uh, yeah, it's certainly, again, that's part of the whole uh, why it is that policymakers are so gripped with interest rate resets. If in that scenario, what then? So that's why they're, they've been putting all these mortgage stress tests in to make sure that people can repay their, their mortgages with the prevailing outlook for higher interest rates. Never, uh, it, it's, it's not impossible that interest rates spike higher, but the, the overwhelming consensus is that things are going to be drifting higher, not spiking higher. Well, you know, air slowly leaking out of the tires, not spiking the tires, as it were. So you talked about strategic defaults, and I know regulators tend to sometimes worry about Alberta and, and what's going on. Have we, in, especially given what's going on now with the oil prices and some of the other things in Alberta, have we seen any experience in Canada where strategic defaults are happening? And do you have any comments about uh, Alberta and areas there? So Alberta is actually a very interesting uh, case for another reason in that they have non-recourse loans. The Alberta and Saskatchewan, I believe, are the two because farm, it goes back to farming days. So 
so the first leg down in oil prices came in late 2014, and surprisingly, prices have been quite resilient, right? Well, that's because you got severance packages, and you know, people, the way the Bank of Canada models the world is that the last thing to happen is that people sell their home when they lose their job. The first thing they do is they rip through their life savings, including their RSPs and what have you. And that's why it takes time. And, and then holding out for hope, right? And now um, those severance packages and so forth are, are beginning to run out. And indeed, um, of late, we've seen prices start to melt down in Calgary. And I think it's only the beginning, particularly if, uh, if we have this lasting decline in oil price, this new leg down, uh, just when you think thoughts were going to be, just when you thought things were going to be getting better, maybe, uh, maybe not. So, uh, a lot of those head office jobs in Calgary are gone and gone forever, and those severance packages are running out. The wage, the income growth in Calgary has been stagnant at best. So, let's leap ahead now to when now they have to renew their mortgages and they don't have a job. Um, are they going to be able to pay? That's it's a, it's a very worthwhile question. I, if, I, if I were a betting man, and I'm not, but if I had a gun pointed to my head and I was forced to choose, I would say, yeah, um, you're going to start to see not so much strategic defaults, but foreclosures. Because just people, people can't sell their home because there's no buyer, and they can't afford to service the debt. So in terms of a strategic default, and I think you know, when it comes, comes due for renewal, it's like, yeah, it's not so much a default as a foreclosure. It's the, they would much rather stay in their home, but what if they can't? So there's already some people out there you know, getting ahead of that curve with increasing the rental market. They're thinking that that's a better bet, so the, the stock of, of rental units out there. But yeah, Alberta is, it's, it's only just beginning to, the real worry, and speaking with my counterpart over at the Calgary Real Estate Board, there's a real, like people are really grim. Economic, you know, the economic sentiment there is just, it's grim. So, yeah, um, I think there are gonna be some tougher times ahead, particularly since they've got a massive oversupply of homes compared to the level of demand. So you're gonna see price declines. Um, I don't think it's gonna be so much a matter of strategic default. I think it's gonna have more to do with employment than it does with prices. Thank you again, Gregory, yeah. and hopefully we can convince him to come back and give us an update this time next year. Um, thank you all again for coming, and my contact information I think is at the bottom of the invita invitation. Feel free if you have a thought, if somebody you'd like us to bring in to speak, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. So thank you all again, and have a great day.